All right, now in John chapter number 11, we all know the story of Lazarus. He had died. They said for Jesus before he had died when he was sick. Four days later, Jesus shows up. Lazarus has been dead. As Mary put it, Lord, he stinketh by now. He, he's good and dead. All right, well, we know the story. He said, take away the stone. Lazarus come forth. And loose them and let them go. You can preach six ways the next Sunday on each one of them topics. But here in chapter number 12, we see Jesus sitting down and eating, and Lazarus is one of them. And verse number one is six days before the Passover. Lazarus, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. Right, well. Then they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Kind of hard to deny that Jesus did something when the proof's right there. Right, but then the great passage of Scripture where Mary takes that box of ointment, the spike nerd, very valuable. She broke it. If you read your Bible, you find out she was keeping that against the day that Jesus died. Mary knew what he had taught, what he teaches that he had to go and die. Right? But yet, in the next chapter, the one that we're not going to be in, chapter 13, you'll find that Jesus starts talking about how he must go away. That one would betray him. And yet, the disciples didn't believe him. What Peter said, not so, Lord. And... He was pretty sure that Jesus wasn't going to die in order to tell God to his face that God was wrong. But yet Mary believed that he was because she had already put up this spike near this ointment, very precious, against the day of his death to honor him. But yet she decided she's just going to honor him while he was here. But then, if you go down to verse number 9, much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, who he, Jesus and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. Now, Pharisees, don't get me started on them. They're bitter. They like to do damage to others. Jesus called them a generation of vipers. They like to bite and they like to poison or envenom others. But really, what did Lazarus do? It says that they wanted to put him to death. What did he do? All he did was die and then get back up out the grave. Not because he decided to, but because Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. What he do? He's just sitting there eating dinner. Everybody knew that Lazarus was dead. Well, somebody went and told them that Lazarus wasn't dead no more. And people just wanted to come see if it was true. They said, well, what are you talking about? Lazarus is dead dead. He stinks by now. They said, oh, no, he's alive. Who did it? Jesus. Well, let's go see. And they get there. What's Lazarus doing? He's just sitting at the dinner table. We had all these people come out to see what the Lord had done and to see the proof well, Lazarus was the proof and as a result the chief priest said let's kill Lazarus too notice verse number 10 but the chief priest consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death why is the also because they were trying to kill Jesus and they decided that Lazarus was on the you know, next spot on the list what can we do to get him I don't know. What could you do? To do? All he did was get buried and then came out the grave when Jesus told him to. Right, so along them lines, in these verses, I see a real good depiction of what today is modern spiritual warfare. Look around and show me Jesus. We can't. He's ascended to sit at the right hand of the Father. Look around and show me the work of the Lord through the Holy Ghost. We can't. We heard about, I think it was, yeah, no, Wednesday night. Talking about that veil. Right? We've got a veil over our eyes now. This 
curtain before us that we can't see the spiritual things. I mean, in fact, the Bible says, you know, who can discern where the wind bloweth, when it's going to blow, when it's going to stop blowing, when it's going to blow next? We can't. It's the same way with the Holy Ghost. All we can see are the effects. But in today's spiritual warfare, who's the target? Well, the devil knows he can't touch Jesus. The devil knows he can't touch you unless the Lord okays it. But is the world really angry with you? No. Does the devil truly have a, all the way back to the alpha of time, does he have a beef with you? No. Who's he have a beef with? The one whose throne he wanted to take, and as a result, he got whacked on the head and then cast out of heaven. He's got a problem with God. But see, the Pharisees up to this point, or the chief priest, up to this point, what the day, they've been trying to kill Jesus for years at this point. Every time they tried to, they couldn't touch him. So they said, you know what? Let's try and go after Lazarus. If he's not alive anymore, there's no proof that he was raised from the dead. If he's dead again, then everybody that's heard Lazarus was alive are going to go out to see him, and he's still going to be buried in a tomb somewhere. So let's kill him. The same way today and what we face. Why does the devil want to destroy you? Because if he destroys you, there's no proof that Jesus ever did anything. Keep in mind, the world is a carnal place. They believe what they can see, what they can hear, what they can touch. God gave them a measure of faith, but they haven't chosen to exercise that faith yet. They'll use it to put their faith in a whole bunch of other stuff. But when it comes to something new, and we were the same way when we were lost in trespasses of sin, all we believed was what we could see, what we could feel, what we heard what we could reason away with our intelligence, what we could understand. So if the world is looking for proof that Jesus did something and you were the only one left, would they be conspiring to kill you? Because that's the only reason that the devil will try to destroy you. I know that he can't unless God says so. And if God says so, he's got something bigger in mind. So, why does the world seek to destroy the church? Because it's proof that Jesus did something. Why do we in our daily lives encounter spiritual warfare? Because they can't defeat Jesus, but if they can defeat us, the proof that Jesus came by is gone. What do you think that the Inquisition was about in history? Really, they'll tell you nowadays that they were going after Protestants, but no, they were going after anybody that didn't agree with infant baptism. They were going after people that didn't believe that the church was the way for your salvation. You know who that is? That's people that believe this. It wasn't just the Lutherans and the Methodists and everybody. No, long before them, they was persecuting these, this group called Baptist. You know why? Because we just believed that proofs in what Jesus did. But as long as that crowd's still around, guess what? They can't prove that their way's right. So they tried to discredit, they tried to destroy, they tried to demoralize. All for the purpose of getting you to be quiet. But sometimes you even being quiet isn't enough. Look again. Verse number two. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. He wasn't talking, he's just sitting. Sometimes the very proof that you're still around is enough to make the world angry because it's still showing that Jesus is up to something. They came through the worst storm of their life. They may not be saying anything, but their boat's still sailing. And that's proof enough that whoever's the captain of their ship better than the captain of the ship of the world. He's not doing much. But what's he doing? He's just happy in what the Lord done for him. They're having a supper. They're getting ready to put the feedback on. They're sitting down listening to the one that spoke, let there be light, and he's having a conversation with them at the meal table. I'd be enjoying it. But through it all, 
Lazarus. His name is put on the hit list. Right, well, you say, well, why do I go through this? Why do I go through that? Well, it's because you have been identified with the one that scoffs. I mean, he winks at our ignorance. But could you imagine if somebody tried to explain some of the things that people believe today to God to face? We're going to see it one of these days at the great white throne of judgment. Where they're going to say, but Lord, this is what I believed. And he's going to say, none of it's true. But yet, he winks at our ignorance and all the intellect of man, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of truth. And yet everything that they're trying to do, their whole agenda, something always puts a wrinkle in it. And what is it? That man can't earn his own salvation. And that without outside intervention, he's destined to die and go to a place called hell. Because of what he did, because of the sin-cursed blood that he inherited, and because of who his forefathers were. No way of getting around it. But yet there's this one group that says, yeah, but it doesn't have to be that way. Do you understand truly what the gospel does? When it's propagated, when it's spread? It takes authority away from those that think that they're in control. People don't get saved until they realize that they lost and they need to get saved. But there's a whole group of people out there that think they have all the answers and they don't like it when somebody comes along and says, hey, my life used to be miserable until Jesus came by my way. Because the more they hear about Jesus, the more they hear about what they don't have. You want to know why the devil sends the imps of hell after us? Why we contend not with flesh and blood but against principalities and powers? You know why that happens? Because he wants to shut us up, sit us down, and throw us in a ditch if he could leave us for dead but you know why he desires to do it he can't touch Jesus can't touch what he did at Calvary can't touch the blood sacrifice that he took up to the glory seat in, or the mercy seat in glory he can't taint or defile anything that Jesus did but if he can get us to shut up there's nobody to tell the rest of the world about what Jesus did Look at the story. Show me something that Lazarus did bad. Show me how he flew in the face or defied the law of Moses. What'd he do? He got sick. You know what happened? He died. It's going to happen to all of us one of these days. Right? Unless the Lord come back and we hear that shout, the voice of an archangel, come up hither. All righty, we're out of here. But all he did was just live. And then what happened? Something miraculous happened that he had no control over. Although, I don't know, Brother Buster, you've been at this a lot longer than me. I was thinking about this last night. I may be wrong. But I believe that somewhere when Lazarus is down in Abraham's bosom and he heard Lazarus come forth, I believe he had the choice. I mean, Jesus never did anybody anything for anybody without them asking him to. I mean, blind bar man, what he cried, have mercy on me. The woman with the issue of blood believed she didn't even have to ask him. She just had to touch the hem of his garment and she'd be made whole. But what her action said, Lord, I need you. I believe Lazarus could have said, no, paradise is pretty good today. I believe he listened. Lazarus come forth and he said, boys, I got to go. I know that voice. See y'all a little bit later. Not knowing that Lazarus wasn't going back to Abraham's bosom. Where's he going? Well, after Jesus went to Calvary six days later, there was no separation between the dead and those that, you know, had been redeemed. There's all one group now. So where'd Lazarus go then? He went to glory. He left paradise and went to heaven. But, anyway, that's just something I was thinking about last night, Brother Mike. You're welcome. What was the only choice that Lazarus had? I can do what Jesus wants me to do. Or I could, not, I could stay here. All he did was just say, the Lord told me to come, I came. How did you get here? I don't know. He did all that. 
I was somewhere else. And then now I was back here. But even when he got out the grave, what did he say? Loose him and let him go. He was so bound up, he couldn't move. So I had a guy that was dead, wrapped up in grave clothes. If we go and look at what Joseph Arimathea and Nicodemus buried Jesus, what did it say? About a hundred pound weight of clothing. You bind somebody up that tight, how in the world are they going to move? So how did he get out? Jesus lifted him out. Jesus did something like this. And the next thing you know, he come floating out. I don't know. But Lazarus came forth. And they had to cut him loose so that he could get away on his own. He didn't even let himself out the grave clothes. But yet, they wanted to kill him. He said, Brother Jordan, I'm just trying to live a life pleasing unto the Lord. All I'm doing is following instructions. Best I'm doing, I'm trying to love people. I don't want to start conflict. But I don't want to be involved in contention. I want to be a friend to people. I want to help others. I want to go to places that nobody's been before and shine a light that people desperately need to see. But just by your very existence, you're shining a light that there's something missing in this world. And as a result, the devil, his crown, the world, all the false cults and religions in the world, they want to destroy you. What was Lazarus doing? He's just having the time of his life. Getting ready to probably eat the dinner that tasted best you know, he's ever had. I'll take that back. He's in paradise. They probably had good food there, Brother Buster. I don't know. If they ate in paradise. I don't know. What are you saying? He's just long for the ride. His eyes are fixed on Jesus, and he's going wherever the Lord tells him to go. But as a result, he had many enemies. But at the same time, there were many converts. The verses we just read, many came out to see Lazarus. And why did the Pharisees seek to kill him? Because many believed on Jesus because of Lazarus. Now it's a you say, well, Brother Jordan, that's not right. They should have seen what Jesus did and believed on him anyway. True. Everybody was without excuse not to believe that he was the Son of God. But yet, people had heard about what Jesus had done, but they'd never seen something that Jesus had done before. Well, when they came walking in, they said, I remember when we buried you. That was proof enough. They'd heard that something had happened. Lazarus didn't need to do anything. He was just the proof. I believe that if somebody walked in and said, Lazarus, what in the world happened? He'd have said, ask him. That's the one you need to talk to. I don't have any answers for it. I was sick, I died, and then now I'm alive again. That's all I know. Well, how'd you get here? I don't know. I didn't even walk out of the tomb. He brought me out. Lazarus was the metaphorical street sign that just said, I don't, I don't know what you need, but I know he's got the answer. I don't know where you're headed, but he could take you someplace better. I don't know what you're facing, but he's got the balm of Gilead. He's got a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. He's the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. I've said it many times. We're not supposed to be the light to the world. We're just big giant mirrors. It's our job to keep our mirror clean. Keep all the gunk off. Keep all the, And then we're supposed to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. When the light from him reflects off of us, that's the light that gets shined into the world. Well, you can break the mirror. There's no more reflection. If the mirror gets dingy, I believe that they'd have been okay if they'd have just run Lazarus off. They sought to kill him. But if they could have made Lazarus go on the lamb, maybe like David, run away and hide in caves, people couldn't see him anymore. Maybe call him a traitor, call him a murderer, call him a whole bunch of different things. They could ruin Lazarus' reputation. But as long as Lazarus is still around, you know what his actions would have testified to? I didn't do none of that. But if you can get rid of the proof, you can make whatever story you want to. The world 
may seek to destroy you, but they'll be happy if they can just demoralize you. They can get you defeated. You know what I honestly believe from that day forward? Anybody that came by their way, Lazarus would say, hey, see that, that grave over there? Yeah, I used to be in it. Well, that don't make no sense. What were you doing, burying somebody? No, I was getting buried. And for the rest of his days, he was the proof that Jesus had done something. Go look at the madman of Gadara. You find that Jesus, after he went and cast all the legions of demons out of them into the swine, right after that point, he said, no, as much as the mad... Well, he wasn't a madman no more. The man of Gadara wanted to come with Jesus. Jesus said, no, you got to stay and you got to tell them. Jesus only came by their way one more time. But when he did, multitudes came out to see him. Why? Because one man was enough proof. But if that man had been defeated, demoralized, multitudes wouldn't have come out to meet him. I dared say that the man who used to be mad wouldn't have even come out to meet Jesus because he had been ashamed of what he didn't do for the Lord. That if the world can keep you defeated because of what you used to do or because of what you did or can get you so depressed and dejected now that you don't think there's a reason to keep on going, it's the same thing as killing you. If you just keep to yourself, keep your mouth shut, keep your head low, duck in and duck out as quick as you can, you're not a factor to them. Because nothing about your life confronts them with the fact that Jesus did something. Because here's the, if we boil it all the way down, if we had a big old math problem, and I could get it all the way down to one plus one for you, the fact that Jesus did something means that something needed to be fixed. So if Jesus never did anything, everything's fine. This is the way it was always supposed to be. This is normal. No, it's not normal. It used to, man used to walk with God in the cool of the day of the garden, have fellowship with him. There was no separation between God and man. Man was made in God's image and was made to be God's fellowshipper. I mean, that's why he made man. He had the angels, but he had no fellowship with angels. He wanted someone that would choose to worship, to reverence, and to love him because they wanted to, because they had free will. That's why man was created. But see, Jesus had to do something because man fell by his own choice, with his own sin, which means only God could correct that situation. But if Jesus never did anything, nothing was ever wrong. But this rock's just been around for 6.8 billion years and was made out of a big bang, and they can believe whatever they want if Jesus didn't do anything. They can believe the T-Rexes used to look like chickens. That's what they say. That all dinosaurs are closer related to birds than anything else, so they must have all had feathers. How do you know? Did you see one the other day? But anyway, we're getting sidetracked. Point is, it's not just about your destruction if they can demoralize you. If Lazarus would have been so ashamed that he wasn't sitting at the dinner table with Jesus, everybody that came out wouldn't have found anything to see. They'd have found Jesus, but they weren't looking for Jesus. Tell me the time when you were lost that you were looking for Jesus. Jesus sent somebody by your way that had already been talking with Jesus in order to get your eyes on the one that you hadn't seen before. To open the light to your eyes. Well, if they'd have come out looking for Lazarus and not found him, they'd have been disappointed, even though the one that was altogether lovely... Right, the Prince of Peace was sitting at the dinner table. They'd have left disappointed. Now maybe that's their problem. Maybe what? But the truth is, Lazarus was there as a big old arrow pointing right to Jesus. You know, our lives are supposed to be just signage pointing the world to Jesus. In the midst of all the destruction and all the chaos and everything else going out there, there's still a few signs that say, hey, life can be found that way. You don't have to face the second death, which is the lake of fire, that way. It's pointed unto men once to die, but if you're born twice, you only die once. 
every now and then you might run into somebody like Nicodemus that says I don't understand how I can enter into my mother's womb be born again he says not not of flesh not of blood but of water spirit right, this is going back to the grave because it's cursed with sin but this thing down here this can be sealed preserved forevermore to where our soul lives on for all of eternity but see all of that witnessing your testimony it's all dependent upon whether or not you're a example of what God did or whether your life looks just like the rest of the world they don't see anything different they're not going to look at you we as our pastor says look like the world act like the world smell like the world sound like the world there's not going to be anything that catches their attention that's just more white noise in the background but see they knew that Lazarus was dead so when they scanned the table of everybody that was sitting there I mean you know what they would have seen they'd have seen one guy who according to your Bible made himself of no reputation he wasn't comely Christ just looked normal wasn't anything special about him according to your Bible physical appearance he just looked like everybody else so they see a guy that's just as normal as normal can be they see a whole bunch of fishermen that used to be fishermen but now they're following this guy who just looks normal around and then they get all the way down and oh that was the guy that was dead something caught their attention see here's the thing some of the world may look at me just see a preacher's kid may look at me and just see a guy that works a nine to five may look at you and just see somebody that used to be a tax collector may look at you and see somebody that used to be a physician may look at somebody else in the church and just see someone who well, there's Nathaniel someone in whom there was no guy he had a good reputation but that's not going to help me with what I'm looking for what are we looking for we're looking for salvation may not see anything special with me but you may be the very one that says I remember what they used to be and they're not it anymore they used to be dead but now they're alive I may not mean anything to that person but you may be their Lazarus doesn't matter how spick and span I think I'm doing today they may not see anything special in me because they didn't know me before they don't know my life but everybody that came out to see Lazarus they knew that he was dead and when they showed up they said he's, he's alive it's not like he just got real sick and now he's better no he's dead dead he was thinking dead but yet as a result when they came and they saw that he wasn't then that caused the next question what in the world happened then who's it getting back to the one that at first glance they didn't think had anything for him but yet he had the words of life but you know what all that is contingent on doesn't matter how good I'm looking if I'm not the one that they're going to look at and see and realize they're not what they used to be anymore I can't help those that you're the Lazarus for you can't help those that I'm the Lazarus for why every day Bible very so many times it says today not tomorrow not yesterday today that's all we can affect doesn't matter how good I looked yesterday how right I was with God yesterday how spiritual I felt yesterday doesn't matter how much I intend on getting closer to God tomorrow what matters is today if I'm not the best I can be somebody may not see anything different in me and if they don't see that Jesus has done anything they're not going to stop to ask what he did doesn't matter how great the preaching was on Sunday if I don't live the life that I'm supposed to be Monday through Friday people aren't going to see what they need to see in me you don't even have to get discouraged and depressed and dejected 
All you got to do is just ease up. All Lazarus had to do was not respond to come forth. That's a pretty simple command. Come forth. What's that mean? Get over here. Lazarus couldn't even do it. He's bound head to toe. But I truly believe somewhere down in the gable end of his soul, he said, Lord, I'm on my way. And then Jesus picked up a, whatever he's wrapped in, brought him out. What he's saying, so much is about your desire, your determination. Lord, I know I'm not going to be perfect today, but I'm going to do my best. Because anything less than your best isn't enough. God gave his best and expects our best. And unless I give my best, I'm not going to be positioned, I'm not going to be prepared, and I'm not going to have the priority to tell other people about Jesus in my life. I'm not going to be headed where I need to go to tell the people or to show the people what Jesus has done. When I get there, I'm not going to be prepared to answer the questions. Why? Because when you're caught off God, the last thing you want to do is do something you weren't prepared for. You just want to get out. Well, hey, can you tell me what's going on down there at church? Uh, here's the pastor's phone number. Call him. Yeah, that was real effective. I don't have the time right now. Can we talk about it later? They're never going to bring it up again. But you're not going to have the priority. If our eyes slip off of him, we're only serving one master. We'll love one and hate the other. If we're not looking at him, we're looking at self. We're looking at the world. We're looking at things. If it's not our top priority, right? we're bound to just forget about it. Anybody been there? Mean to do something and forget all about it? It was the most important thing to you in the world when you woke up. But by the time you walk out the door after eating breakfast, your mind's already off of it. It hadn't even been an hour, and yet it's completely left your train of thought. It's because certain things take priority in our life. They're more important. They jump up to the top of the list. The one thing that should never fall off of the list is Him. But if He's not our priority... If he's not forefront and center in my life, what are people going to look at in me and see any different? He's the only thing that's good about me. I've been grafted into the vine. You know what that means? That the vine's growing, starting at the inside of me and working its way out. I need to get as much of me out the way so they can see him. I think it's called the Napoleon orange tree. Napoleonic orange tree, something like that. We'll end with this. There's only one way to make one of these trees. According to what I've read. This, you just take a normal orange tree. I think that's like them cuties and everything, the ones that don't have the seeds in it. This is how you make them orange trees. You take a regular orange tree and you don't change anything about it. Then you go find one of them Napoleonic orange trees. And what you do is you got to dig down into the ground. You don't go to the tree. You get close to the tree and you start digging down until you find a big root. You cut that root out the ground. You don't take all the roots because then the poly little orange tree is going to die. So we take that root. We go back over here to the regular orange tree. We dig down into its roots, only we're getting up real close into the big roots. You find one, you hollow it out, and you put the root from the other tree inside of that tree's roots. Then you bury it back. What happens? That thing that you took out of this one starts having an impact on the inside of that one. And before long, the oranges start looking different. They're not the normal oranges like they used to be. They're these kind of oranges. They're easy to peel with your fingers. They're manageable. They don't have seeds on the inside. Well, how something that doesn't have seeds reproduce? You've got to take what was the original thing 
and find another tree to put it inside of. As much fruit as we're supposed to bear, we can't make more Christians. Only He can do that. But the day that I decide I want to stop growing the fruit that He gave me, I don't have any purpose anymore. The day that what He put inside of me is quenched by my spirit and my will and my directive, you know what's not going to happen? People aren't going to find a fruit that they can taste and see that the Lord is good. My life's only going to be a representation of bitterness, of maybe destruction. You ever see a tree that started to die and a windstorm come by? It can take somebody's house down. It can ruin a car. If it's bad enough, that whole tree might get yanked out by a tornado and destroy a whole city, a whole block. That's what happened down in Kentucky not too long ago. What happened? It just changed a little bit. It's still an orange tree, because that's what it was at the beginning. But orange trees weren't helping nobody. It took the fruit that God had for them that they needed. I may still be an orange tree, but I may not be the right kind of orange tree. I may have asked the Lord, you know what, Lord, this is good enough. We're close enough to what you want me to be that I feel comfortable and I can still live the way that I want to without having to be confronted with the fact that you want more from me. That's not a tree that's going to impact the area around it. Because I can't help the other orange trees. I can tell them where to go. I can tell them who to ask. I can get them right to the very spot that God wants to deal with them and confront them. But still, they need to decide. Why do people decide to believe in the Lord? Because they believe that what He did was real. Because somewhere along the line, God has, that's what the word conviction means, by the way, convinced them that they were a sinner and that he's the one that can help them. Well, how can you be convinced that somebody can help you unless they've helped somebody else before? That's why they wanted Lazarus dead. That's why the world wants to see you defeated. That's why the devil wants to see you destroyed. But if we can stay determined, we may not do anything more than just sit at a dinner table and listen to what Jesus is saying. But somebody may walk by that says, I remember what they used to be, and they look a whole lot different now. I was there when he was wrapped up in grave clothes and dead, and now he's grown fruit. And it's not the same fruit he used to grow, because I know what that was. That's the same kind of fruit I've got in my life. But the fruit that he's growing now, that's different. How'd that happen? Because he's just an orange tree. How's he growing something different than an orange and how do they know it's different? They finally get curious enough that they say, all right, it's, it's about the same color of the fruit that we got, but it looks different, it's shaped different. They finally take a bite of it and realize that it's a whole lot different. Did any of that directly happen because of what we did for ourselves? No, it happened because of what Jesus did for us. But the decision that we have as to whether or not just to be what God wants us. In fact, I believe Brother Buster preached one time, bloom where you planted. Don't know where that came from, from the recesses of my mind, but thank you, Holy Ghost. Just be what God wants you to be where you're supposed to be. Don't argue about being planted over yonder. Don't argue about, well, I want to grow this kind of fruit. Just be what God wants you to be. Be content, godliness and contentment, great gain. And be content that, Lord, I may not be much, but if somebody comes by and sees something special about me, I'll tell them about you. Because that's all Lazarus did. But just because you're doing what God wants you to do doesn't mean it's going to be an easy day. We don't know the rest of the story, what happened after. Because for a while, the high priest, scribes, the Pharisees, Sadducees, they was all pretty happy. They was content because they thought we got rid of them. And then three days later, he got up, and then they didn't have him no more. Then they tried to disprove that it ever happened, and they got sidetracked for a little bit. But eventually a day came that the church of Jerusalem was scattered. Why? Because they were the proof. I don't know what Lazarus did for the rest of Lazarus' life after he got back up out the grave. But I believe at some point somebody came by and tried to discredit him. 
tried to discourage him, tried to destroy him, tried to get him run on down the road and forget that he was ever there. But as a result, you know what he had to do? He just had to be determined. To, I'm, I'm just going to tell you what Jesus did for me. What you do with it, that's between you and God. But I can tell you, taste and see that the Lord is good. He does all things well. His ways are above our ways. But most importantly, He'd do it just for you. The thing that makes Lazarus special and all the other great examples in the Bible is that those that suffered the most adversity, they were the ones that made the biggest impact. The ones that had the most reason to give up in the flesh were used greatest by God because they just realized that His strength was made perfect in weakness. That His grace was sufficient. That no matter what the world threw at them, greater is He that's in you than He that's in the world. The flesh may not like it, but they just so head over heels in love with Jesus that they said, Lord, come what may, I just want to tell people about you. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.